Mark chapter 6, Jesus is going back to Nazareth. This will be his second visit. If you remember, he visited Nazareth when he came out of the 40 days of fasting out of the wilderness, and he announced to the synagogue there his mission, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This now in Mark chapter 6 will be the second time that he goes to Nazareth. Now, if you remember, the first one didn't go so well. Jesus was escorted expelled out of the synagogue, and his best buddies took him to a cliff and tried to throw him off. Jesus, what in the world are you doing going back to Nazareth? Well, of course, Mark would let us know about this second visit. Mark's gospel is the second chance gospel because Mark himself was given a second chance. And so Mark is showing us that Jesus is the God of the second chance, and he's going back to Nazareth, his hometown, with his disciples. Let's pick it up from there. Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Then he went out from there and came to his own country, speaking of Nazareth, and his disciples followed him. Now, I've underlined that in my Bible, and maybe you would as well. His disciples followed him. When the Sabbath had come, He began to teach in the synagogue. Many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? And we begin to see, uh, the Bible reveals to us the trade of Jesus, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Now, if you are coming from the Roman Catholic faith, they believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, that she was a virgin prior to the birth of Christ and remained a virgin after Christ, and that Jesus does not have any brothers or sisters. That is not the case in Scripture. Here it's very clear that obviously Joseph must have passed at this point. He's not mentioned. And Mary's children are mentioned. In fact, the very book of James is written by the half-brother of Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph. Now, James alone is one of the reasons that I came to faith. You see... If I was to tell you that I was the Christ, my sister would go online and tell you my sinful acts. She would be very faithful to let everyone know that I did not live a sinless life. James became a believer. The brother of Jesus became a believer of Jesus. Can you imagine what it was like as a kid growing up with perfection? Can you imagine living under that shadow? And James said... He is the sinless Messiah. I do believe in him, and James came to Christ. That, for me, is convincing proof. Take a look as we go on, verse 4. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. It's amazing when my kids showed up for Christmas, they didn't care whether I did the dishes or not. You would probably care. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. They didn't have faith. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. And I believe in the sending of two by two. There's accountability There's opportunity. In fact, when I came here to Calvary Chapel, South Bay, Pastor Jeff, when he asked me, said, would you and Pastor Zach come to Calvary Chapel, South Bay? He knows how wholeheartedly I believe in Scripture that we must go two by two, and he himself believes it as well. Verse 8, he commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bag, no bread, no copper in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Who would sign up for that mission trip? When our ladies went to Romania, their bags were 75 pounds each. (laughs) Verse 10. (laughs) Susan, don't look at me. Also, he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. 
And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now take a look at this in verse 12. So they went. They followed, the disciples did, and I've underlined this as well in my Bible. And so they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Looking at this particular story, Mark is trying to get across a point. You'll see there the disciples followed in verse 1. Now Jesus made it very clear, disciples, what it means to follow him. In Luke's gospel, chapter 9, verse 23, he said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's what the Bible says. Listen again. Deny himself? Oh, this is, I am no longer known for who I am, but I am known as a Christian. I am known as a Christ follower. I am known as Christ in the world. This is what Paul was talking about when he says that we are hidden in Christ. People don't see us anymore. They see Jesus. Do you remember hide and seek? Do you remember hide and seek when you would go and find the best hiding spot and no one could find you because you had been hidden and no matter how long they looked, they could not find you. Well, I began to realize when my family played hide and seek with me that I would go and they, I'd be there for hours. <laughs> began to realize that maybe quite possibly they weren't looking. <laughs> I was hidden so well, I thought. Take up his cross. You see, Paul would say again, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. You see, taking up my cross is allowing Christ to live through me. There was a missionary. His name is Jim Elliot. And in 1950, Jim Elliot, he gave his life on the beach in Ecuador as he was ministering to a native tribe who were headhunters. And he went to them, landed on that beach, and that day that he landed, he lost his life for the gospel. But before he died, he wrote this in his journal. He is no fool who would choose to give the things he cannot keep to find what he will never lose. Is that a statement of our faith today? Because what Jesus is communicating in regards to following him is losing our life in order to find it. That is the statement of what it means to follow. The disciples knew this. And the Bible says in verse 12, knowing this, they followed him and the disciples went. They did what Jesus asked them to do. They preached the gospel and they ministered to people. They go hand in hand. In fact, if you go on a mission trip here at Calvary Chapel South Bay, and we pray that you do, you will not find us just digging a well. You will find us digging a well and preaching the gospel. You see, in order for it to be a good work, it's simply a work if we dig a well. But if we preach the gospel, it officially becomes a good work because the two go hand in hand. Here at Calvary Chapel South Bay, we don't believe in a social gospel. In fact, we don't believe that you can add any adjective to the word gospel beside the one that Jesus did, the everlasting gospel. We believe in the gospel, and the gospel is best preached and ministered, and that's what you'll find on a mission trip at Calvary Chapel South Bay. And in their obedience, they got to experience what is available for all of us today. They got to operate in the supernatural. The power of the Spirit was moving through them, using the gifts of deliverance, using the gifts of healing, and they're operating in the supernatural. Guys, let me explain something to you. Do you think it was easy for these three girls to get up front on this stage and communicate and sing the way that they did? 
They were operating in the power of the Spirit. Think of the joy the disciples had when they came back and said, Oh my goodness, people were healed, demons were cast out. The same way these three girls are in the back, I promise you, high five and we did it. Because when I asked them to do it, we're, we're, we're not doing it. And my response was, Oh, you don't know me. God wants that for you today. Well, you're going to put me on the stage? We had Disciple Life at our house last night, a group of about 27 young people. And we are starting Sunday nights here at Calvary Chapel South Bay. I want to let you guys know. On February 12th, we will be starting Sunday nights at South Bay, and I will be teaching through Song of Solomon. So all my married couples, I want you here. And if you're a premarital couple, if you're a wannabe couple, you need to be here, Okay. <laughs> Because we're going to teach you how to do it right through the Song of Solomon. That's going to be our first book. And I looked at one of the guys and I said to him, oh, you may teach one of the Sunday nights. Oh, <laughs> oh I'll have to go to the Lord with that. And this is what I did. You will teach on Sunday nights. The Spirit's in me and speaking through me. Some of us were like, wait a second, are you going to come to me? Don't let this scare you. Because Jesus will never call you. He'll never send you unless he prepares you. You see, Mark is going to reveal to us the discipleship process that Jesus puts them through to equip them for the work of the ministry. Take a look back at verse 2. It'll be the first of seven points. The first is, he modeled for them. Take a look at verse 2. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Jesus went to church. He modeled for them. He modeled right behavior. Now, I need to remind you about this Nazareth group again. This was the same group that expelled him and tried to throw him over a cliff. If Jesus ever, if anyone had a complaint against institutional, organized church, it's Jesus. In Jerusalem, they wanted to kill him. And in his own hometown, they tried to throw him over a cliff. Let me explain something. There's a movement today of those who say you don't have to go to church. And they don't want to go to church because of the stains that are on the bride. And we are the bride of Christ. Can I remind everyone, the church is filled with a sea of sinners saved by grace who are not perfected. Of course the church is going to be messy. Of course there's going to be things in the church that people can look at and go, well, I'm not going to church. Look what those people do. Now listen. I'm not giving an excuse. I'm just dealing with the reality that we're sinners saved by grace and there's going to be issues. And if anyone had an excuse not to go to church, it was Jesus. If anyone had a complaint against the institutional church of the time, it was Jesus. Yet the Holy Spirit would support the model of Jesus when he would say in Hebrews chapter 10, don't neglect gathering yourselves together. We don't come to church just to learn. We come to church to encourage each other and to spur one another on. Monday's rough, man. I don't know about you, but Monday through Saturday is rough. And then all of a sudden I hear these three girls sing and my spirit is ministered to. One of you shakes my hand. One of you gives me a hug. And all of a sudden I'm ready to face Monday again. See, going to church is not a religious routine of the faithful. It's a weekly family meeting where we get to edify and encourage each other all the more as we see the day approaching. Don't fall into the trap of I don't go to church. Follow the model of Jesus. Number two, I want you to see again in verse two, he began to teach in the synagogue. He taught the disciples. He taught them. You see, his disciples were in the crowd. They were following him. They were sitting in the synagogue with him. Right there, they were sitting. And they weren't just uh, listening to what he was saying. They were watching how he was ministering. Now, I encourage all of you. If you watch Christian television, I want you to watch. I want you to turn off the sound and just watch the preacher. You might see this. You might see this. with sweat coming off the brow. <laughs> oh, to be a fly on the wall, to watch Jesus teach. The 
crowd was amazed at his wisdom and the power behind his ministry. Fortunately, though, they didn't believe. The Bible says there in verse uh, 3, they were offended at him. They were offended that Jesus thought you could come back here again and teach us. After all, Jesus, we know who you really are. You're the illegitimate son of Mary. Who do you think you are to come back to Nazareth and instruct us? We're not going to learn from you. We're offended that you came here. But for me, I wish I would have been there. I wish I would have been sitting. Whenever I go to Israel, we go to Magdala, and you can see the seat that Jesus would have sat on to teach in that synagogue. And I just can only imagine, what did you say? How many of you would want to have sat in that synagogue to hear what Jesus would have to say? I think we can all say, I would. Well, I got great news. We can. We can. You see, in John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said to his disciples, the Holy Spirit, the helper, will bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. And we have the New Testament. Everything that the Holy Spirit wanted us to know, the disciples wrote it down for us to learn. Now, our job is to do what the disciples did. Learn it and share it. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, the apostle Paul says, what you heard from me, share with other people in the faith. Don't keep it to yourself. The disciples took what they heard and they spread it around the world. Passing along our faith has been the direction from God from the inception of our faith. Let me tell you what God says about Abraham. The very beginning of our faith. He said, I know Abraham in Genesis. I know him and I know he will tell his children about me. That was the testimony of God about Abraham. So much so, Moses would even put it in the law from God. The law directed that we were to pass to teach the legacy of faith to our spiritual and to our physical children. He taught them. Number three, he trained them. They're in the synagogue. They're listening to the message. They're doing ministry with Jesus. And they heard him say, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. They are there with him as he's speaking those things because Jesus believes in on-the-job training. I'll never forget, I came to California. I want to learn how to sail, like race sail. And so I had a friend of mine who had a racing sailboat. He said, okay, show up on Thursday. I showed up on Thursday. He said, okay, pick up the lines. Now, I don't know if you know this, but a line is a rope. You don't say rope on a boat. You say line. So I picked up the lines, and he goes, okay, uh, take us off the dock. We're heading out. For what? A race. I just got here. I know. We're going to race today. The only way that you can learn is if you do. So we're going to go race today. So in the middle of the race, he goes, hey, Go haul that jib up. What's a jib? What's the front of the boat? Just pull that line. I pull the line. The wind hits. Thank God he told me about the lifeline. I grabbed onto it when the sail hit me and threw me over on the other side of the sailboat. They don't even know I'm hanging from the sailboat as they're racing down the way. All they're upset with is that the jib hasn't gone up. (laughs) Jesus believes in that kind of discipleship. You see, they were doing the work of the ministry while they were learning. Serving and learning are part of the process. Sitting in church is only a part of the process. Learning shows us how to serve. But the way that we learn, serving puts learning into action. And the way that Jesus did it was he taught them, not in a classroom, he taught them while they were on the sailboat. They were in the midst of serving while they were learning. One of the greatest lessons that they're learning is the lesson of faith. Because these people in this synagogue, they didn't have faith. Look at verse 4 again, if you would. The Bible, excuse me, uh, uh, yes, verse 5. Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. 
He marveled because of their unbelief. And he couldn't do any mighty work. Now that word could not do, he wasn't able to do mighty work. Wow. Let me tell you why. The way of God is to partner with our faith to do mighty work. That's how he's glorified. The way of God is to partner with our faith to do a mighty work. This glorifies him. Now let me compare these people in Nazareth to another guy. His name, we don't know. He's a Gentile Roman centurion. It's Matthew chapter 8. And this Gentile Roman centurion, he's got a Jewish servant who is sick, a slave, a Jewish slave who's sick. And he comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, look, I'm a man under authority. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. I know who you are. He's saying you're the authority. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. But I know if you just send the word, my servant will be healed. And every time I go into a hospital room, I pray the prayer of that man's faith. Jesus, we are not worthy for you to come into our house. But I believe from heaven, if you send the word, he can be healed of cancer. I believe, I believe like the centurion. And I want to trust. And the Bible says that when the centurion said this, Jesus marveled. Now, which kind of marvel do you want? Do you want the kind of marvel where Jesus looks at these three girls today and goes, Whoa, look at my daughters. Go get them. Whoa, that is awesome. Hey, Gabriel, do you see Christine up there? She's terrified, but she's trusting me. Or do you want this kind of faith? Oh, good. There they go again. What kind of marvel do you want? Do you want the kind of marvel of your unbelief? Or do you want the kind of marvel of your belief? He trained him. Number four, take a look at verse seven. And he called the 12 to himself. He called them. And I want you to note something there. He called them to himself. You see, each of us have a calling from God. And every calling is to glorify God, not you. It leads to himself, not to you. Each of us have a calling from God. Now, you may have a general calling. Maybe you're a mom or a dad. You know what your calling is. Be a parent. A general calling is basically the idea, bloom where you're planted. Jesus, he said this, bear much fruit. The idea, though the biblical statement is not there, bloom where you're planted. Just bear much fruit in whatever state you find yourself in. That is a general call to all Christians. But you may have a specific call, like go to Mozambique, go on a mission trip, serve in kid life, give your life for the Lord. I don't know what your specific call is, but No matter general or specific, it will lead to glorifying Jesus. That's why Peter, when he would write, if you're going to speak, if you're going to sing, if you're going to minister, whatever you do, do it so that God is glorified. How many of you believe that these three girls glorified the Lord Jesus Christ today? Amen. You see, he called them. Now, he used my voice. And quite possibly, he might do that with you today. You see, in Acts chapter 13, when the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas, it wasn't this mysterious sound. The Holy Spirit's in us. And someone stood up in church that day and said, I've got a word from the Lord. Set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work of the ministry. You see, the Holy Spirit will use you and use me to speak into our life. Now, you might say, I don't know my calling. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, maybe you need to get to know him as your Lord so that he can give you your responsibility. Let me explain. Do you remember when Saul, the great apostle, soon to be Paul, met Jesus for the first time? He's on the road to Damascus, and Jesus looks at him and he says this, shows up, bright light. Okay, you don't want this happening in your life. It wasn't a great experience, okay? Shows up in his life and he goes, Saul, Saul, Why are you persecuting me? 
Why are you kicking against the goads? I've been trying to get your attention for a long time, Paul. That's what he's saying. Why are you kicking against the goads? I've been trying to get your attention. And you know what the Apostle Paul did next? He asked two questions. The first one was this. Acts chapter 9, you can read it. Who are you, Lord? He made Jesus immediately Lord of his life. The next question he asked was, what do you want me to do? You see, there are too many Christians in our world today that are telling God what they want to do and asking God to bless it because Jesus is actually not their Lord. He's their puppy dog. Come on. Come on with me. I want to go to this school. I want to have this job. I want to move to Texas. Bless me, Lord. I want to marry this woman, and I want to do this. Come on, Jesus. Are you with me? You see, Jesus says, I'm your Lord, and I tell you what to do. And you follow me just like the disciples did. You see, the truth of the matter is, we've got to ask ourselves the question, is he our Lord? And when we make him our Lord, we won't mind what he asks us to do, even if it is give our life in Mozambique and be separated from our husband and our wife because we're choosing to give our life for the Lord. And in the 21st century, you might go, well, I don't think that's Jesus. Well, it obviously is because he's in jail in Mozambique and he chose and him and his wife said, we have surrendered our lives and no longer do you, we want you to know Ryan Coer. We want you to know Christ and him crucified in my life. You see, the truth of Scripture is making him Lord. Then he'll give you your calling. Take a look at the next. He called the 12 to himself. And um, the whole move to Texas thing, that wasn't in my notes. So if that's a specific word for anyone here, you'd better make sure that God is telling you to leave California because he needs Christians here. Amen. Remember, remember, he didn't send Paul to like Happy Go Land. He sent him to Corinth. It was the modern day California. And began to send them out. He sent them. He sent them. Them. Now, I need to make a quote from Gerald Irwin because he used to say this all the time. These are the disciples, not the apostles. They don't even have a passing grade yet. These are the disciples. They're still failing. And Jesus sends them out. Church, I need to tell you something. I'm going to get rid of your excuse right now. God is not waiting for your perfection to use you. He will perfect you as he uses you. He's not waiting for you to be perfect. Trust me, I'm not perfect. He's using this position to make me perfect. Just be willing to do whatever our Lord wants us to do. Amen? Amen, Amen means I agree. Be careful. <laughs> Number six. He gave them power over unclean spirits. He empowered them. God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. He will always give you a task greater than yourself because it makes us dependent on the Spirit. And when we look back, we will say, look at what the Lord has done. He alone will receive glory. I told you last night we had about 27 people at our home and with their spouses. So it was probably close to 40. And uh, my wife was asked a question and she gave, was giving an answer about when we were called to go to Liberia and we had a three-month-old child. Then she had a baby over there. Then we took our other small children over there and we adopted kids. And she said last night, she goes, I can't believe I did what I did and took my three-month child to a war-torn country. It was only the grace of God that I did it and I survived because I don't know if I can do it today. And as I sat there and I listened to her humility express to an entire group that it was only the grace of God, last night I went to bed and I said, look at what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He alone receives the glory and he alone is who she was dependent on. Finally, number seven, 
I want you to see in verse 8. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. Who's signing up for that trip? He directed them. Now, gang, I need to let you know, this is a specific direction for this specific journey. Jesus has brought them to Nazareth to reveal to them no mighty work can be done if you don't have faith. So he sends them on a faith-filled mission trip to put into practice what they're learning. And his direction was for that specific trip. Let me show it to you. It's Luke chapter 22. You don't need to turn there. Maybe write it in your notes. Luke chapter 22, verse 35. And he said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. You got it. You learned to live by faith. Then he said to them, verse 36, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. You see, there's a dis different lesson of faith for a different trip that he was sending them on. And we've got to be careful to pluck out scripture and say it's the Lord. We've got to gain understanding of Scripture to know it's the Lord. Now, let me tell you how the Lord used this Scripture in my life. When Andre and I went on the mission field, the Lord had me read this Scripture, and I had a rhema word from God speaking to me, do not raise financial support to go to Liberia. Now, we had all like seven bucks in our account, okay? Now I'm thinking, how do I go tell my wife with her three-month-old child that I'm taking her to a war-torn country and God has told me, don't raise support. So we sit down for dinner and I start the process and she begins to weep. I'm like, great, this is going over perfect. Thank you, Jesus. Set me up for marital failure. I need Song of Solomon on Sunday nights. <laughs> and she goes, Chet, the Lord spoke the same thing to me and I didn't know how to tell you. So we got on a plane, and we landed in Liberia. The next day we were there, someone supported us for one month. The second month, someone supported us for the second month. And the third month, someone supported us for the third month, and we began to realize why God called us not to raise support. Because in the third month, we were begging Jesus, no more money, we want to go home. We had made the commitment that as long as money was there, we would stay in Liberia. And God knew in the third month we would want to get out of Dodge. So he told us, don't raise support, make a promise to me, and I'll keep sending the money. And God left us in that place for three and a half years. Imagine a missionary saying, please don't send any more money. <laughs> and God was faithful. He knew what we needed because he knew it was going to be hard. And that was his lesson to us at the time. But let me tell you something, I got prideful. I started telling missionaries, oh, yeah, we didn't raise support. <laughs> we trust the Lord. <laughs> Unlike you, Mr. Send Your Newsletters. <laughs> and then God spoke to me when we came home. Hey, you're going back to Liberia. This time you're raising support. Excuse me, I've told everybody we don't do that. <laughs> it's another lesson for you to learn. It's called humility. And God had me raise support painstakingly. Do you know how difficult it is to stand out in the foyer as everyone's just passing by, knowing that you're there to raise support? Don't see the missionary. Don't see the missionary. Don't go say hello. They're beggars. Do you know how humiliating it is? And that's why when we have our missionaries here, listen, I don't care if you give 5 or $10 or you don't give anything. Just walk up to them and say, thank you for serving the Lord. You see, I understand that God had a different lesson for me. It was a lesson of humility. So we've got to be careful. When you read things like pluck out your eye and cut off your hand. Because what I don't want is a, a, a prosthetic ministry here at Calvary Chapel South Bay. Now understand what I'm trying to get across. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul exhorts us to understand what the will of the Lord is. When you don't understand Scripture, seek godly counsel to gain understanding. Now, there is an important spiritual principle here that goes for all ministry. 
Jesus says, look, when you go into a house, when you go into a city, go into the house that receives you. It's like a modern day hotel. And stay with them as long as they'll have you. But if they don't want you, wipe the dust off your feet and just keep going. It's a ministry principle. I call it go with the flow. Go with the flow. When you see the Spirit moving in a direction, follow Him. It's the Spirit of our Lord leading you. Let the Spirit of God show you how to move. So I spoke to the girls. I want you to sing. Ooh, in front of everybody? Yes. No. But then God began to lead. And they decided, despite their feelings, to take a step of faith. They knew that the Spirit was leading them because they had a peace. Now, I need you to keep something in mind. The Spirit will always lead you peacefully in the way of the Word. He's never going to lead you away from the Word. So if you've got peace, but it doesn't go with the Word, it's not the Spirit. Let me explain. I have a pastor friend of mine. And they would have elders come before, and they would stand up front, and during worship, the elders would come, and then the people would come and pray with the elders. Well, women would leave their purses back at their pew at their seat, and there was a woman in the church who would go and steal from the purses as they were up in prayer. So the pastor noticed it and then thought, watched it the next week and approached the woman, true story, and said to the woman, hey, you, you can't come here and steal, churches, steal from purses. Her response, the Spirit led me to relieve these women of their material possessions. <laughs> hey gang, that's not going with the flow. That's a visit to the popo. <laughs> the spirit is not gonna lead you to marry an unbeliever, even if he's cute. It's not what the Spirit does. That's not going with the flow. In the South, that is going with your bow. I mean, it's just the reality. So the Spirit will always lead towards a direction with peace in the Word. Now, church, Jesus has done a great job of preparing these disciples. They followed him, then they sent him. He equipped them. And Mark lets us know how he equipped them with these principles. I believe he's equipping you. Let's pray. Father, I come before you in Jesus' name, so grateful for the great word that you've given us. Mark chapter 6. Wow, Jesus. Thank you for showing us how you take the time to train us and make us ready to serve. And I believe now we got some business in the church. Christians, I need you to listen to me. I believe that God is calling some of you. But the problem is you're like Samuel when he was a kid. You're running to Eli asking all these questions because you don't want to hear the call. Three times Samuel ran to Eli. Is that you? Is that you? Is that you? I believe some of us are like the Apostle Paul. God's been trying to get our attention for a long time. Why are you kicking against the goats? Why not experience the high five of following the call of Jesus and live in the supernatural? So today, I know it's my voice, but is it Christ's call? So I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but I do want to pray for you. If today you're willing to take that step of faith and answer whatever call it is that Christ has for you, you've been resistant. And you want to put feet to your faith to allow the Lord to send you to serve wherever he wants you to be. Would you stand right now in your seat? We want to pray for you, and I see you. Amen. I see you. Yeah. I see you. Amen. I see you, each and every one of you. Oh, Lord Jesus, 
as your spirit continues to minister and people are standing all over this room. I pray for us. Strengthen us. Those of you who are standing, would you mind just lifting your hands as an act of surrender? Lord, we surrender. We surrender our lives. We want to be hidden and we want everyone to see you. No longer just sitting in the pew, but being a servant and following after you. No matter where you might send us, no matter where you might call us, no matter where you might have us, Lord, we're yours. Our hands are lifted because we do surrender. We hear you. We're not running to Eli anymore. We're not kicking against the goats. We're responding in Jesus' name. Church, would you stand with us? Calvary Chapel, South Bay, we memorize scripture. Have faith in God was last week's. This week, would you take a look? It's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. The Bible says, understand what the will of the Lord is. Would you say it with me? Understand will. Excellent. If you don't understand, ask. It'll be given to you. Seek to understand what his call and what his will is for your life and what the word actually means. Challenge to change is more an act of meditation than anything else this week. Take a look. Keep in mind that you don't have to be perfect to be used by the Lord. He will perfect you as he uses you. Amen. Let's close in this worship song. God bless you guys. We'll see you on Thursday.